Right. Rabbit R1, the I cannot device. I cannot access your calendar on the R1 device. Can I assist with something else? I cannot send emails. I am not able to read the text in the image out loud. I cannot determine the exact length of the reflecting pool, but cannot identify or name any individuals. But I cannot generate audio or speak the text. I cannot determine or state how much the energy drink costs. I cannot open DoorDash on the R1 device. I cannot open YouTube on the This R1 could device. be for a lot of different reasons. It could be connection issues because cloud connection is massive here. It could be time consumption of the ask. It could be that the user didn't set up it right. And this is exactly the expectation for these type of devices where we think they're gonna make something. If the person doesn't wanna use it certain way, or if they are using it a different way or giving some sort of feedback that it doesn't work, it's user I'm problem. You know. specific directions. I cannot set timers. If you need a reminder, you can say a note I cannot for the life of me come up with one thing that this does better than your phone. I really want to keep it constructive and still quite critical because there are so many lessons we can learn from the emerging tech, in particular the LLM, LAM, generative model type of technologies which just came out. And there's so many more to come by the way. If you look at the data, a lot of the investment has been done into the early stage or disruptive AI. A lot of the VCs in a lot of different fields, especially when it comes to consumer technology, have been looking to reinvent the technology, to produce something groundbreaking, which could kind of pave the way for them to, I don't know, for the next decade at the minimum. But I believe both of the companies have the same vision and mission and the iterative steps we wanted to take to go to the market. And that has been always not to immediately replace the iPhone, and that's a good thing, by the way, but to incrementally introduce something which would be almost like a companion device and then go forward. But the five reasons of why the adoption of them would be challenged today in this very day is the immaturity of the technology, the delays, the feedback or lack of a feedback or even focusing or over focusing on the feedback instead of affordances is a massive issue. Poor variability, again, massive. This is UX part, right, as well, because you need to wear certain things to be able to pull it off, not from fashion sense, but from very logistical sense. You also probably need to consider if it's hidden or like at what angle and things of that nature. This is ergonomics and this is human factors. It's how the actual humans would use a newly built device. Three, previous experience. I think everybody had experience by now with Alexa, Google Assistant. I don't know what it's called anymore because I haven't tried it in so long and it's telling as well. You obviously, your expectations are built up upon that too. And anything which requires hardware, which is super difficult as it is, plus taps into that existing interaction uh, methods and technology and the expectations from the behavior side informs the attitudes from a consumer. You always want to make it better. And it isn't. There is massive delays and delays always mean bad design. There has to be, even if in a feedback giving a loader or telling that it's going to take a few minutes, it's way too long, especially for the simplest of tasks, for it to be desirable. Complexity and trustiness. This is another one. It will be possible to customize our experience with blah, 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 blah. Same as Rabbit R1. You almost have to do an extra step to onboard yourself. And there are even demos of Rabbit R1 where people were basically are told no by device. Your calendar on the R1 device. Can I assist with something else? I cannot send emails. I am not able to read the text in the image out loud. I cannot determine the exact length of the reflecting pool, but cannot identify or name any individuals. But I cannot generate audio or speak the text. I cannot determine or state how They're much the just not set up. Off. And if a device, even if my, let's say, a smartwatch, whatever, tells me, hey, you have to download an app or you have to use something else for me to work, this is a big ask. It's a, probably one of the biggest asks which you need to design for very, very carefully. You know, you could argue that it's the only way to do so today, 
but in that case, it just isn't ready for the market. It's still at that kind of like a proof of concept state. It's very clear that to adopt it for actual work, a person has to want it so bad that they're gonna force themselves to create habits to practice it and use it because the interaction is so limited. Alexa and others are used generally in homes where a certain level of privacy exists, not the case of these devices, not to mention the issue of data collection and privacy. That's true, Kevin, but also, to challenge you a bit, I think both of them are coming with privacy first. I don't know how much of it is marketing, but at least on their websites or at least one of those value adds, quote unquote, features, they are stating that the privacy and, and data security is utmost priority. That's like a number one thing, basically. I think both of them, at least Rabbit are one, if I remember. I think you are right in a way that it's less private from physical perspective or hardware usage perspective because you have to use it in the open. You have no privacy of eyes or ears. You know, you have to use your voice. There you could argue then there's issues of accessibility and everything along those lines. But I think, you know, it's again, different beast. It's not a phone which, you know, you can tap things and nobody sees it. Like from that perspective, there's no, no eavesdropping from very physical perspective. From a software perspective, the lesser the friction or the more guided, at least, even if it's full of friction, the better, right? Like you always want to smoothen the journey so that people are guided and they can self-serve and on board. Challenge to the habits, big one. So this is immediately disqualifies the device from work environments, from social environments. It's really made by techies who work in isolation for other techies who work in isolation. And now I'm putting it frankly and blunt, but I think that's what it is right now. I think another thing is having yet another device to charge, yet another device to take care of and familiarize and adopt and basically learn to use. A lot of people are gonna say it was the same with a phone and things of that nature, but you didn't have alternatives. And now you do, you have your laptop, iPad, phone, yada, yada, a lot of other devices. This is a massive me to UX challenge. God damn it, it would be so difficult from stakeholder perspective to make it right, but also from the user perspective to make it right of how they would adopt that solution, what they would think of, what their presumptions would be, what their behaviors would be, how you would treat those conflicts when they would arise because they would. When people don't understand something, what are you gonna do with it or how are you gonna incentivize them to adopt it? Anyhow, three years to get into to the market. It's a lot of time, but for hardware, it is nothing. It's literally nothing. Granted, teenage engineering, as an engineering or design firm or consultants, they have a lot of um, experience in bringing these things. So I likely we used blueprints or templates or boilerplates of what we had to actually create that, you know, ID or industrial design, the actual design engineering for this, simulations and things of that nature. We obviously had some sort of IP behind it before we produced and launched it. The actual LLMs and software, obviously took a while and I'm think we are still on that journey to for obvious reasons to make it right. It's $199 per device, one off. And this is something which I discussed with Dan Saffer on Experience Design Podcast. Make sure to check it out because it's dedicated on design for AI. And I think one of the things which he highlighted was the actual feasibility of things, but viability more so. Generative AI type of services is cheap for you as a user, but it's not cheap to run for the maker. This is the invisible part which nobody thinks about because to actually sustain that and to tell a person that whenever you want something, you can ask that Rabbit R1 and it's gonna use the generative AI model and it's gonna use cloud-based interfacing and it's gonna exchange the data live is a big promise and a big bet to take because someone has to pay for it. If you pay 200 bucks, you likely are paying less for the device and software. You, they basically are going in debt until they can entitify it. Just like let's say any other service like Uber was so cheap. Now it is not because over time they had to get that money back. Like what would be the future cost of it? And you could argue, why would I care if I'm UX designer? You should care a lot because that's exactly what UX strategy is like. You have to care because people are going to ask it like the user who's going to adopt it is going to ask, why is it so cheap? And is it going to be free as a go? Because that's what's going to require a commitment. And a lot of the people are speculating at that. The stated plan is that there will be a store where users can upload the rabbit AI macros. They create and then other users will pay 
to purchase those. So there's some sort of peer-to-peer -peer exchange and marketplace type of mechanics where people are gonna buy things from each other. I know this is a designer just conceptualizing it, but saying this should have been an app, spot on. It could have been version one, could have been an app to test with a superb app and then introducing hardware as a secondary device once the actual hardware can keep up with it and there's enough ability to port it. Building in the world is 2,717 feet. And in that case, what is the actual point? And I'm asking everyone on the chat, what is the actual point of the hardware if you could actually containerize it and keep it just as a software? I know it's less flashy. It doesn't look as good. It doesn't not going to get as much attention and perhaps VC money. Too few affordances, especially for someone who would adopt it outright. Like people have to go through so many trials and errors as evident from those demos to figure out how to use this or what's a, what's what we can achieve it and what we absolutely cannot achieve it. What's the spectrum of the range of the actual interactions, which would give some sort of feedback. It's too early. This is the, the POC level hardware and engineering, if you ask me, and UX for that matter. R1 said it wanted to move on from app-based devices. Yeah, they wanted to, but you have to do it right, Delphine. It's a really good point. Like, you know, the intention is clear. Like, you can't argue with that. We definitely had good vision, but this is not a product. It's still a prototype of what it could be. It's not experience ready. It's made as if it's a software project and as if money is endless and as such, we can make more changes and as if we're gonna do countless iterations. But having worked with hardware, which is another spin, hardware is extremely hard and generations of hardware. If you take this fat pen, amazing pen, by the way, I highly recommend it. It's uni award-winning pen. I I had to take it from my wife because it's so awesome. This is innovation on its own, a first generation of pens of something different, basically. But the hardware for it and to reach the next generation is gonna take another year or two or three because we are gonna have to make new molds, we are gonna need to make new design choices, we are gonna need to test it, take user feedback. Hardware design takes years to get to the next generation. Therefore, Uni is probably going to mold and have the same hardware for the next few years to come. And as such, Rabbit R1, because of this early stage, kind of let's just churn it and push something into the market and learn from it. They can only improve on the software end. On the hardware end, people who bought it are going to be stuck. And when they say stuck, it's soft, soft stuck because they can obviously choose an alternative or leave it be or buy a new one. But Humane AI pin obviously is slightly different. Way more cash flow, 200 million. Company was founded in 2017, seven years ago. I remember what they did seven years ago and I remember working on an AI project. From that perspective, if that would be incepted with and we started with, God damn it, like they were way ahead of the time. Obviously result don't match with the vision, just to put it bluntly. So you're paying 700 and then 24 a month subscription. So you have to pay to use it. Biggest lesson learned I think here is that this is what design looks like without a product. Lessons learned. And Kartik followed up, not even design though, because UX is part of design and there is no UX to speak of. And I have to agree. Either the UXer who was part of the organization kind of got shelled or pushed away into a corner and they weren't effective, or they had no UXers whatsoever because there's so many cardinal sins of UX made here, especially when it comes to interacting with the laser device itself. If not for the actual laser projections and interacting with your hand with a limited scope and a certain angle, which requires a lot of ability, even from the fittest of individuals, this would probably be an okay assistant device. As soon as you turn it on, after four hard resets, for, for me, it all falls off a cliff hard. The laser display is very hard to use. The gestures obscure the screen and it does not track your hand. It also does not work in the sun. Four four big ones. Obviously there's more, more symptoms, more different ways to express these issues. This has been designed in, again, as I mentioned in the in a beginning of this stream, by 
engineers who work in isolation for engineers who are gonna work in isolation. Someone who, like in a certain environment. And it's very comical because I can picture in my head someone working in their basement to come up with this. Obviously very fancy, well-funded basement, but something which is not well lit. And someone maybe who is not really actually gonna use those laser gestures in real world or in a social situations or somewhere else. And you can argue the quality of the projections, things of that nature, this specific gesture of using fingers and things of that nature, selections, I have no idea how you would make that precise. You would need to train the user to do certain motions at certain angles. You, could, you would need to ask for them for so much. From ergonomics perspective, that's why it's such a big sin. Like you would need to use this device. Like I don't know how to even stress this enough. This, this is just mind boggling how bad this is. The better, like I know more uglier way would be to create another screen or even ask a user to use a phone which they can use with their one finger. So they don't stress and develop a, a carpal tunnel syndrome uh, or anything else because it's asking for them to do motions which are unnatural. Did they even test this poop emoji? I don't think so. Or di they didn't test it enough or in certain environments. That's clear. When you ask what you're looking at, it simply brags about itself. Turns out you need to speak an exact phrase just like Siri. Again, asking for too much of a user. I don't know what else to say. Also, when it does work, it simply says with what chat GPT would, what API is super interesting, yada, yada. So we cut a lot of corners. Let's see what that is. What am I looking at? And the nail in a coffin, it makes a smug joke about not being able to teleport you to a location and then instructs you to open the maps on a smartphone. <laughs> this is it. That's where the limit of affordances is and that's where you get the feedback from the actual device to, which tells you if you wanna live, if you wanna actually go about, you have to use your actual smartphone device. So it's far off from replacing anything. I mean, it has very sharp constraints and limits to it. I know we raised a crap load of money, but you have to be fair, you know? it's That's not what success means, at least not lasting success, because the trust erodes. Like, I would never trust their device again unless we do something paramountly different. And there are so many generations again away from that. Their next device, for it to be desirable, feasible and viable, would have to be generation two, and that's gonna take them years. And obviously maybe this was concepted back in 2020 or 2021, and maybe we have a backlog to make something else, but this could have been an app. You could agree with that, right? And I know I hate apps, but this could have been very simplified solution. If these two devices are supposed to be Bolt Visions, then clearly shipping 1% of that 99 degraded experience is not the right approach. I think people who don't have money or who don't have investor money would choose that 1% approach because they have to do it. If you have all the time in the world, you probably are going to try to push the boundaries at the right at 50%. The actual quality of experience probably would be an inverse bell curve. Let's say this is your percentage underneath the Y axis is your quality of experience. Because with the lesser you would have adoption, you would have addressing some sort of needs. It would be very clear and fixable and quickly fixable. I would say that you could control the quality at, and the same way, if you could actually achieve that 100% of a vision, the quality would be, you know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be set, it would be there. But now if you try to attempt to do something in the middle, which is way too complex on hardware and software, and it's not easy to fix, or you don't do enough user testing, you kind of like drop the quality so much that you cannot adopt it, it doesn't do the user need. This is where I think the humane and rabbit are living, the two meatballs basically. Again, rough measures, and you know, just shooting from the hip.